Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist uh, giving you some uh, speech perception and music perception for your sensation and perception class. Um, so normally when I've taught this, I don't typically talk about music perception because uh, it's pretty, pretty short. Um, but I thought that it might be a good idea to work it into the lectures. Um, certainly something that has been getting me through this very stressful time is music. Music has a very powerful way of kind of touching our emotions. And so I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about it a little bit. And I also tell you this to let you know, you will occasionally hear me sing on this lecture, um, hopefully not terribly. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so here's what we're gonna cover for this week's lectures. So we're gonna talk about uh, music perception. We're gonna talk about musical notes and hearing. And then we'll talk about some of the aspects that are involved in actually producing music, melody, and rhythm. And then we'll spend uh, probably a good bulk of this lecture uh, talking about speech perception. So we'll talk about the vocal tract, which becomes really, really important for being able to speak. We'll talk about the different speech sounds that can be made, and we'll talk about speech processing and the brain. So we're going to start by talking about music perception, and in particular, for right now, focusing on music notes. So music is one of those things, for those of you that are planning on taking my learning and conditioning class uh, next spring in 2021, uh, this is something that is actually a cultural universal. So this is generally, regardless of culture, regardless of upbringing or country of origin, music is something that uh, all members of the human species and have produced. So music is something that is universal across all cultures. And in fact, it turns out that music has been a part of the human species for well over 30,000 years. So um, I'm opening up a link for you. It is taking its sweet, sweet time. Um, but as we're kind of waiting for that to load, uh, your notes do actually mention that um, some of the earliest known musical instruments were produced about 30,000 years ago. And um, you can actually see this image. I am not going to play this story for you, but I thought you might find it interesting. This is a cool link to check out. Um, what you're looking at are um, flutes, ancient flutes. Um, made out of vulture bones. Now, obviously, a lot of these, um, this one, you're going to actually see a replica, but this was reported back in 2009, the world's oldest musical instrument, uh, made of vulture bone and mammoth tusks. They were found in caves in southwestern Germany and date back to a time when modern human beings who actually looked like us were first venturing into Europe. Scientists have little doubt that music is so basic to human nature that it goes back to our earliest days as a species. So if you want to hear about it more, you can actually see the uh, NPR link up above. You can check that out. Um, so music is something that's very much a part of our lives, and it fascinated even people during ancient times. Um, so you might be familiar with the work of Pythagoras largely through his work in mathematics, particularly the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you know, that good stuff. Um, but it actually turns out that music has very interesting mathematical properties. And because of these mathematical properties of music, this is something that actually um, interested Pythagoras very, very much. Um, so one of the things that we do find, for example, and we'll talk about this a little more, when we play a note and then we play its octave, the frequency of the octave is two times as large as the original fundamental frequency. So music has these very interesting mathematical properties, and that might be, that's what makes them fun to learn about, and that's what makes them fun to study. So let's talk a little bit about music notes and our understanding of frequency. So one of the most important aspects of understanding sound is understanding frequency. And our perception of frequency is a pitch. 
Now, obviously, musical notes are not complex tones. They are obviously dealing with harmonic spectra, but they do have fundamental frequencies. And generally, um, the majority of musical sounds that we hear range from uh, about 25 hertz to about 4,200 hertz. So to kind of put this into perspective, here are the notes on a piano. I do not play piano, so you'll just have to kind of take my word for it. Uh, from this image. So you can see that the lowest note on the piano, that lowest note is about 28 hertz. Um, so that's really close to some of the lowest frequencies we can hear. The highest note on a piano is four, uh, 4,186 hertz. So that's really close to some of the highest notes we can hear. And to kind of put it into perspective, here are some of the different ranges of instruments. You can see a harp has a pretty wide range. It plays some of our lowest frequencies as well as some of our highest frequencies. And that makes sense. Like the piano, it's a stringed instrument. Um, other instruments are obviously going to be different. A guitar is probably going to capture more of the middle range. Um, a bass saxophone is probably going to get closer to those lower frequencies. You can see it goes as low as 49 hertz. Um, a tuba is actually pretty similar. A soprano saxophone is going to get more of those mid-range and higher notes. And a piccolo can go as high as about 3,951 hertz. So basically, we can hear the lowest note of a piano uh, to the highest notes of a piccolo. And that's pretty impressive when you think about it. And as we're going to see too, that range is relatively restricted. We can hear frequencies far above 4200 hertz. Um, but it's going to be, uh, as we're about to learn, it's going to be really, really difficult for us to perceive music um, in anything that's over 5000 hertz. And we'll kind of talk about why that is. We're not exactly sure, but it is interesting. Okay. So pitch is really important to understand musical notes. So you're probably pretty familiar with an octave. So if I play, if I sing this note, ah, uh, and then I hit an octave, ah. Uh, actually, no, that was not an octave. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, there we go. That's an octave. So an octave is an interval between two frequencies, and it basically has a two to one ratio. So if I have a fundamental frequency at 250 hertz, its octave will be at 500 hertz. But here's something that's kind of interesting. So clearly frequency is really important for understanding musical notes, um, but frequency is not the only aspect of pitch that you need. Um, so it turns out that C3, which is about 130.8 hertz, sounds more similar to its octave, C4, which is 261.6 hertz, than it does to a completely different note. So C3 sounds more like its octave than it does E3. And that's despite the fact that C3 is definitely closer in terms of frequency to E3 than it is to C4. But despite that, um, what that really tells us is that frequency is not the only aspect of pitch that we need to be able to understand musical notes. So our understanding of these very simple uh, mathematical ratios helps us to uh, understand and process musical notes. So clearly frequency is certainly a part of it, but it's not the only thing that we need. Um, so there are two major dimensions of um, musical pitch. There is the tone height, which is basically the frequency. So the higher the tone height, the higher the frequency. And then there's also the chroma. So the chroma you can almost think of um, as the color of the tone. And you can kind of see this demonstrated with this helical structure here. So within this little circular section of space that I'm circling with my mouse, each of those notes has a different chroma, but they have the same tone height. They're all around a similar frequency. Um, so each note on a musical scale, it's going to have its own chroma. Um, so basically when you sing, um, 
notes on a scale like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Um, in those cases, each of those notes has a different chroma. And then we can take that up to, uh, we can take that up in terms of tone height. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. <laughs> As you can kind of see, I am getting toward the end of my range. I'm pretty sure I'm an alto. Um, so you can kind of see that we have these two different aspects that basically creates a helical structure. So you can kind of see that A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5 all have the same chroma, but they vary in terms of tone height. Now, on the other hand, within a given section of an octave, everybody's tone height is about the same, but we have differing chroma. So that's kind of a helpful way to understand these musical notes. You need both the chroma and the tone height to really understand a musical note. Just looking at the frequency is insufficient. So part of the reason that I mentioned that we have difficulty processing musical notes over 5,000 hertz uh, comes from some of the limitations in our auditory coding. So you'll remember pretty recently when we started talking about hearing, we talked about the different ways that the auditory nerve codes for frequencies. So we talked about we talked about place coding in the cochlea. So the idea is that your cochlea has a tonotopic map. So areas that are kind of closer to the base of the cochlea tend to code for higher frequencies. Areas closer to the helicotrema or the apex of the cochlea code for lower frequencies. So we have that place coding we also have temporal coding. Now, because of uh, neuron firing rates, an action potential of a neuron can really only fire every two milliseconds or so, which means that temporal coding without using a volley um, only really works for sounds up to 5,000 hertz. Um, only really works up to about 5,000 hertz or so. So because of that, um, one of the things that's interesting, generally frequency is gonna be processed either by that place coding or that temporal coding. And because we don't have temporal coding beyond 5,000 hertz, um, one of the things that researchers have actually found is that musical sequences of tones that are greater than 5,000 hertz because we don't have that temporal coding uh, become much harder to process. We have difficulty understanding relationships between octaves over 5,000 hertz. We also have difficulty perceiving melodies in tones that are over 5,000 hertz. So the limits of our temporal coding abilities actually hurt our ability to process music at higher frequencies. And what's especially interesting is that very few musical instruments um, produce sounds over 5,000 hertz. Now that could just be a coincidence or it could just be that maybe we have some understanding, even if it's not conscious, of our auditory limitations. So when we talk about music notes, we also have to talk about chords because oftentimes music notes are presented to us in terms of chords. Um, so a chord occurs when three or more notes are played simultaneously. So what you're kind of looking at here, for example, um, with respect to our understanding of the helical structure of tone height and tone chroma, um, so let's say, for example, that we're playing this chord. We're basically going to play a perfect fifth. Um, so this is G2, B2, and D3. So this is a very important relationship between these three notes. It's a perfect fifth. It has a three to two ratio. And one of the things that's interesting is that you can keep going up in tone height and that relationship between the notes will be maintained despite increasing frequency. So when we talk about chords, we often tend to talk about what we call consonant chords. These are chords with very, very simple ratios like a perfect fifth, which has a three to two ratio, or 
a dissonant chord, uh, which is a much more complicated ratio. So for example, your book talks about an augmented fourth, which has a 45 to 32 ratio. That is a very difficult ratio to work out. And it turns out the chord don't sound so good. In fact, this chord is so unpleasant that it's historically been referred to as the devil's interval. And so to kind of give you an idea of what these chords sound like, I'm going to play a few for you right now. Okay, so in this first clip, you are going to hear uh, a perfect fifth ascending and then descending, and then you'll hear the notes played simultaneously so we get a chord. Now those were actually two notes. So in this particular case, this would not be a chord, it would be what we call a dyad. Um, but the same three to two ratio holds. Okay, next you're going to hear um, what is sometimes referred to as a tritone, but it's an augmented fourth, sometimes referred to as a diminished fifth. So that 45 to 32 ratio. So again, you're going to hear those notes uh, ascending then you're going to hear those notes descending, and then you're going to hear the harmonic. Ooh. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> you can kind of see why that got referred to as the devil's interval. As you can see, it's not very pleasant compared to that very harmonious uh, perfect fit. So one of the things that often comes up when people talk about music is they talk a little bit about the concept of perfect pitch. So you probably know some people um, who cannot carry a tune in a bucket. And for some reason, they all want to try out for American Idol. Um, on the other hand, you do have people who are very, very good at, at producing a perfect pitch. So the technical term that we want to call this is absolute pitch. They can accurately name or produce a musical note. So if you say, please give me a C4, they can produce that perfectly. Um, so one of the questions becomes, um, is this due to training or is it genetics? And um, it's, of course, when we talk about these psychological phenomena, the answer is that it's usually a little bit of both. So one of the things that we know is that perfect pitch is really hard to train if you're an adult. You can try to train adults with perfect pitch. Um, I was actually quite tempted. I saw an app uh, because now that I have a little bit more time on my hands, I'm looking for ways to use my time productively. And they had an app to teach you perfect pitch. And I'm certainly not a bad singer um, by any stretch. I'm certainly not great. I could use some lessons. But um, be learning perfect pitch because I do play musical instruments could be really beneficial. But the data shows that training an adult to learn perfect pitch is really difficult. Um, it works a lot better when you're a kid. Um, and one of the other things that we know is that perfect pitch tends to run in families. So there does seem to be a very strong genetic component to this. Um, where the data seems to stand now is that there is a genetic component, but there is a training component too. But you're more likely to acquire perfect pitch if you've had musical training at a very early age. I certainly did not I did not start playing musical instruments uh, until I was maybe about 11 years old. So maybe perfect pitch is not something that is possible for me, but you can still produce pretty great music even without having perfect pitch. So now we're going to move on to talking about music perception and making music. So if you want to make music, you have to produce a melody of some kind. And so sequences of notes will produce a melody and we tend to perceive the sequence as having this single overarching structure. Um, 
But what's really important here is that it's not a sequence of specific sounds. It's more about the relationship between the notes. So for example, think of a melody of your favorite song, but shifted up an octave. Completely different frequencies, completely different notes, but the melody still sounds the same. So to give you a really dorky example, and yes, I am going to sing again, and I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, I have on my playlist an acoustic version of um, an acoustic like cover of Smash Mouth's All Star. Yes, I am that dorky. Um, so if you know the uh, chorus to All Star, and I'll try to see if I can get it in the same range that the song is in. It goes, hey, now you're an all star. Get your game on. Go play. Um, it's a pretty simple melody, but on my cover version, it's a completely different set of notes. It's, hey, now you're an all star. Get your game on go play. So it's a completely different set of notes, but the relationship between the notes is still the same. So I don't feel like the melody has changed. Yes, it's in a completely different key, but the melody is still the same. I don't go, oh my gosh, it's a completely different thing. I'm like, it's kind of interesting to hear it in this key. Um, now, one of the interesting applications of this, how many of you are familiar with like sad cover songs of upbeat tunes that find their way in movie trailers? Um, so probably the most famous example is um, if you've ever watched Donnie Darko or a lot of video game trailers, they use that sad slow cover. Um, Gary Jules's version of Mad World, originally done by Tears for Fears, and it's just very slow and sad moving and slowly moving and very very sad so we have these sad cover songs that typically uh slow the melody down a bit they change the key uh they use different instruments to make it sound darker and sadder it is so i have a little bit of a challenge for you and let's go ahead and make it some extra credit points here. Find me the most ridiculous, sad cover that you can find in a movie trailer or a TV trailer or something and email it to me. And I will give you some extra credit for that. And because I already mentioned Gary Jules's Mad World, you can't use it. Um, but try to find me a sad cover. Um, and let me know if you think that it really changes the melody at all. Now, one thing a lot of these sad covers do, they tend to slow the song down. Like if you've ever actually heard Tears for Fears is Mad World, it's pretty fast paced compared to uh, the Gary Jules version. Um, and so that can affect the quality of the melody. Um, so the tempo and the duration of the notes can affect that quality. So something to think about. And I urge you to um, find some sad cover songs, have fun with it, see how ridiculous it gets. And I will see you in the next lecture.